Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I hope you are doing well, and uh, I hope you are enjoying today's daily Bible reading. Uh, we're at Acts chapter 9. Uh, last evening, yesterday rather, we read through Acts chapter 8, and in Acts chapter 8 we just saw the persecution of the church. Uh, we just saw exactly the power of God demonstrating. Of course, you would note Saul was featured there. Uh, he was actively terrorizing God's church. However, in our reading today, we will see and we will talk a little bit about um, his conversion. I'm really excited about just going through in a systematic way uh, this particular book, uh, the book of Acts. So in our reading today, we note in Acts chapter 9, we saw that Paul, or he was still Saul, he was not comfortable in the persecutions that he would have done to the Christians in Jerusalem. Of course, because of persecuting the church, uh, our brothers and sisters, they were fleeing. And in other places that they went, among the places that they went, would have been uh, to the north of Damascus and overall in Damascus region. And so Saul, in the opening verses, he decided that he was not going to be comfortable with what he would have done so far. And so he decided to get the authority to pursue Christians in Damascus. So he went to the religious leaders of the day for them to sign off on this, um, the atrocities that he was contemplating uh, to commit against our brothers and sisters. His plans would have been to go to Damascus and to seize our brothers and sisters, Christians, and then take them back to Jerusalem for trial. So he was on his way, uh, we note in the first couple of verses, uh, in verse number three, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So he was on his way, he was with a group of um, his team, and they were planning a master strategy of destroying or further destroying the church. However, while he was on his way, very near, ready to pounce, he had a visitation. He was imprisoned by the Holy Ghost. So in verse 4, the Bible tells us before, the light shone around him in verse 4, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now this is very interesting. Um, if you note, so he's now having a moment, an encounter, with Almighty God. It is without doubt that he knew that this was God because listen to what he said. Who art thou, Lord? Now, the King James presentation of this particular verse may not do justice to us on the surface of it because what he was really asking, he was saying, Who art thou, Jehovah? Come on, remember, he knew that Jehovah is God. And so his question was, who art thou, Jehovah? Look at the response that he got in verse number five. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. So Jehovah said, I am Jesus. And for those who are still not settled on the oneness of God, this is one very powerful scripture that teaches that Je the Jehovah of the Old Testament that Paul was very familiar with as a Jew of Jews, he is now learning that Jehovah is Jesus. Now, when he heard that, look at verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? So he was astonished by the revelation, but he accepted truth. You know, brethren, we are in a time when there are so many persons who truth comes. Truth is revealed to them, but they are not prepared to hold on to truth, believe truth. Paul was not like that. So he, his next question was after recognizing that Jesus is Jehovah. The Jesus that he was persecuting is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He didn't fight it. He knew it to be true because of this revelation. So 
after that revelation, he had a question. You know, he wanted to know what he can do. So that he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? In other words, now I know that Jesus is Jehovah. Jehovah is Jesus. What is it you want me to do? Look at the, the, the response of our Lord. Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So before I can give you anything to do, before I can get you involved in ministry, there are some things that you must do. And he said, wait in this space, I'm going to give you instructions. You know, there are people perhaps you're reading through today and you're saying, I know God has a plan for my life, but I'm not sure what he wants me to do. Um, sometimes, you know, we're all, we're trying to find this thing and we think it is so elusive. We want to find what is the mind of God for me to do. And the truth is, if we wait on the Lord, if we do what we can and, and wait on him in service, he is going to reveal to us everything he wants us to do. And so here, of course, Paul was not yet converted. And so he was told to wait into the city. If you look at verse 7, the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So they too had an encounter. They heard, but they could not see. In verse 8, Saul arose from the earth, and his eyes were opened, but he saw no man. He was blinded by that awesome light from the presence of God. And we also see there that he spent three days without sight. He did not eat, nor did he drink. Kind of a fast, isn't it? In verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And him saith the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now the Lord is going to speak to Ananias and give him instructions to go to Paul. And I just want you to consider how God operates. He is using a preacher to minister to this unsaved gentleman to lead him to salvation. He did not preach the gospel to, to Saul. He did not send an angel to preach it to Saul. He went to an established preacher. And when I say an established preacher, I'm talking about somebody who is saved. And he's sending Ananias to Saul. Look at verse 11 with me. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. What was the disposition of Saul after that encounter, he was praying. He was seeking God. He was seeking direction. He wanted to know what he ought to do. So God sent Ananias' his servant to Saul. He was giving him instructions. The Bible tells us in verse 12, And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So the task that God is sending Ananias on, he would have given Paul or Saul an experience, an encounter rather. He was saying to him, this is what is going to happen. I am going to send somebody to you and this is going to be their responsibility. They are going to lay hands on you and your sight is going to be restored. So Ananias said, Lord, you don't know this man. You don't know who this is. This is he who terrorized the church in Jerusalem. And the reason why he is in Damascus is to do the same thing. You know, we are like that sometime, aren't we? We are reasoning with God. We are educating God. So his thing was to say, listen, this man is cruel. He has done great injustice to the church. But the Lord wasn't phased by that. The Lord said, listen, in verse number 15, go thy way. In other words, Ananias, go do what I told you to do. 
for Saul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So the Lord gave Ananias a little bit about what Paul was going to face. But he said, quite frankly, to Ananias, you don't need to lecture me on this. Go do what I have said to do. You know, brethren, we are like that sometimes, you know. We try to remind God. We try to say, listen, God, but so and so. But, you know, we just need to remind ourselves because we do forget sometimes in the heat of the moment, it seems, that God is God and God is always in control. And as I said sometime before, I'll say it again, that one of the lessons I really want to grasp, I want to be able to take from my, my mind the idea that God is always in control, control and, and allow that to become a part of my mind. I want it to grab hold on my heart. I don't want it just to be head knowledge. I want it to be something that I truly believe. Even in a difficult day, I want to truly believe that God is always in control. Now if you ask me, I'll tell you, I can tell you off the top of my head, God is always in control. But I don't want to live like that. I, I want to be able to recite it in my mind, but I also want to know it in my heart. As we would say, in our heart of hearts, when, when the rubber meets the road, I want to know that God is in control. Because, because God is in control of my life and yours, everything will be all right as we live for him. So he was told to go thy way, and he went. He went, Ananias, he laid hands on Saul. Saul received the Holy Ghost, and he was baptized. He, Ananias, received, well, Saul rather received meat, and he was strengthened. Saul spent certain days there in Damascus, and right away he started to preach in the synagogues. He didn't wait for, he started preaching. Because there's one thing, you know, brethren, when truth is revealed to you and to me, we have an obligation to share it. It cannot just be truth that we hold for ourselves. This must be shared with somebody else. Evangelism, the heartbeat of the church, the heartbeat of God. So immediately, Saul, brother Saul, or brother Paul, in as much as in verse 17, Ananias, we see him referred to him there as brother Saul. Uh, after his conversion, of course, he became brother Paul, and he started to preach this great message. Um, of course, the disciples in Damascus were confused by it because they knew that he was the one who was terrorizing the church. But now he is preaching the very message that he was trying to destroy. You know, brethren, God cannot lose. I know that's one of the other lessons that we must internalize. Not just know it because we read it, but know it in our hearts. God cannot lose. Cannot lose. The church cannot lose. The church is guaranteed to have victory. So Saul did his best, but he could not stop the church. Upon this rock, Jesus said, I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail. Now, if you consider today, so much is happening in church circles, you know, church world. And sometimes we become rightly so, so seriously concerned of the state of affairs, and we should. But in the midst of that, we must remind ourselves that God is in control, and God will always have a church. And this church, God's church, will move from victory to victory. This church cannot be defeated. And we see that with 
what Saul was trying to do. So he kept on preaching. And many people were ministered to. He went to Jerusalem, Saul, when he got there. Um, of course, the disciples were concerned. They did not want to have fellowship with him. And just think about it, because, you know, sometimes we, we can go on the negative side of it and, and, and we can make a doctrine here that church people are so unforgiving and, and, and all of that stuff. And, and some of that might be true. I'm not negating that. But, 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 but think about it. Here is this persecutor of the church. He shows up in Jerusalem back and he's saying, oh, I'm with you. Obviously. The disciples, not now the apostles, but the believers, they, they, they weren't prepared to embrace him because they weren't sure if this was so. They were afraid, verse 26 tells us. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Isn't that normal? It's, I think it's normal. It, it's only a logical view to have. But thank God that in the midst of normal, there is always somebody who is able to tap into the spirit, as sometimes we say. For if you look at verse 27, and Barnabas took him. So when everybody was afraid, Barnabas, thank God for the Barnabases of today. Barnabas say, listen, come, I'm going to befriend you. I'm going to make you feel welcome. Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how we had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of the Lord. That's verse 26. And he was with them, verse 28, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Verse 29. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So he was declaring boldly the word of God. He wasn't afraid to declare what is true. Brothers and sisters, we must stand up for truth. He was bold in his declaration of, of the word of God. And that caused the Grecians to have a problem with him. And because they could not win him with the argument, because if you think about Paul, Paul was very articulate before he received the Holy Ghost. Now, can you imagine the state that this man is now in? He is empowered. He is redeemed. He had a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And he's now proclaiming this truth. And people are going to have a problem with him. And it's normal. Because before, he was preaching what they wanted to hear. He now had a revelation. His life is transformed. And he is now preaching the same message that they had a problem with. And so instead of continuing with the argument, they said, you know what? Let's kill him. So they concocted a plan to kill him. They wanted him out of the picture. But again, brethren, God is always in control of your life. As you submit yourself to God, as you live for God, no weapon formed against you will prosper. None at all. So they sought to slay him, but Paul got wind of this. The, the other disciples heard about this. And so what they did, they plotted his escape. Thank God for his goodness. They wanted to kill him, but they could not because it was not their prerogative. They could not destroy him because he is God's man. 
They ca people can't destroy you as you live for God, you know, brethren. If you're genuinely seeking to please God, it doesn't matter what people say or do. God is in control of your life. You live for God. And as you live for God, the Bible says it, all things will work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. So he went on his way. Brother Paul went down to Caesarea and from there to Tarsus. And when he took his journey after a while, we are told in the, in the, in the verse 31, then had the church churches rests throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The church had rest. It was a period where persecution was paused. Brethren, all of us have seasons, including God's church. They started out in a blaze of glory, but then persecution came. And persecution was elevated at different seasons. In chapter 9, we see they were having some rest. And, and people who couldn't come together were now able, you could come together again. And people were edified in, a, in, in central locations. The churches had rested, the text says. People were now experiencing the comfort of the Holy Ghost after all of that fighting, running for their lives. They were now experiencing a season of rest. And in that moment, multiplication was still happening. See? When the church is governed by the Holy Ghost, there is going to be multiplication. Numerical, as well as the development, the growth of those who are within the body. So that was happening. Now, we also notice this miracle here in verse 32 to verse 35. Great miracle happened. Um, Peter was the one, the human instrument that God used. So miracles were happening. And this is a hallmark. It's one of those signs that you see throughout the life of the church. Certainly in the book of Acts, you'll see it. Miracles after miracles after miracles. And predominantly, these miracles were used to open doors that weren't open before. It was an opportunity for people to, to see and to relate the supernatural act with the working of the Holy Ghost. And that caused many to believe. Many believed, many were added to the church. So you'll see, throughout the Acts so far, you'll notice that all of these miracles, or most of these miracles, seemingly were designed to cause people to believe in Jesus Christ and for the expansion of the work of the kingdom, for people to be saved. Not just for somebody to be healed, but for God to be glorified. And if we can create a climate where everything is God-centered, God will be free to work great miracles among us because he won't have to be worried about me taking the glory. Oh, that so-and-so was healed by Brother Gordon, and so Brother Gordon gets the glory instead of God. God doesn't work in an atmosphere like that. God says he will give his glory to no man. So great miracles were happening and many were added to the church. We see also in verse 36 going down, Dorcas, who was raised from death. Of course, um, Dorcas was just a wonderful woman, um, great servant. She ministered to the needs of others. She was a woman who was full of good works. She gave to those who were in need. We see in verse 37, it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. Of course, a part of their culture, they would wash the dead, preparing the dead for burial. But they said, you know something? We are not going to bury her just yet. 
Peter was not far away. And so they sent to call Peter. Peter came, and look at this. Verse number 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. So they, it, was a, it was a very sombre, solemn moment because they were reflecting on the good deeds and the, the, her passing. And they gathered all these things that she would have made. And, and, and of course, you can just imagine how emotionally charged that moment was. But look at how Peter dealt with this particular situation. Verse 40. But Peter put them all forth. He got them out of the room. He kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. Called her by name. And look at what happened. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand, and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. See, again, I'm telling you, these miracles, the writer is emphasizing the impact. That this was not just a miracle for Dorcas to come back to life just by itself. It was connected to a greater move. God was doing something. And God wanted people to learn about him, to know truth, and to come into salvation. And so we see there in verse 42, and many believed in the Lord. That's the focus of the miracles, for people to know. For people to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Last two verses. And it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. So this miracle, the word, the story was transmitted all across the area. And the Bible tells us in verse 42 at the end, and many believed in the Lord. That was the reason for the miracle. You know when we ask for miracles. What is our underlying desire? Is it for our glorification or for God to be glorified and for his purpose in the earth to be fulfilled? Many were added. The last verse. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So, just beautiful book of uh, Saul's conversion, becoming brother Paul. Before he could serve, he had to be sanctified. He had to go through the process, and you see what he was doing. The angel said, listen, he prayeth. So he was fasting, because he had not eaten for three days, and he was praying. And the man of God was sent by the Lord to him, to lay hands on him. His sight was restored. He was baptized. He received the Holy Ghost. And after that, he started to work. He started to preach. He came under opposition not long after, but he remained faithful. So, brethren, as we close out today's daily Bible reading, it's a little different today. Instead of typing, decided just to do it in this video. I want to encourage all of us to remember that God is in control. God is in control of our lives. And, and, and listen to yourself say that. Repeat that with me if you would. God is in control of my life. Now believe that. God is in control. When it doesn't make sense, God is in control. Who could make sense of what was happening with the church in this time? And it wasn't even logical, you would think, right? That the main persecutor of the church would become one of the greatest evangelists 
writing more letters to the church than anybody else through the Holy Ghost. Look at that. I make this one small final point. Let's not discard anybody. Let's pray for those who abuse us. And when I say abuse us, I mean people who just want to see our demise, want to see our hurt, want to see us destroyed. Let's pray for them. Because you never know what will happen on the morrow. May the Lord bless you. Look forward to sharing with you again. Um, spend time and let's read this each day. Um, just very powerful book of Acts. Very excited about it. Um, I've read before, but it's so exciting just to read through again. Uh, the Lord bless you and your family. Maranatha.